discovered is that Dick and Barack Obama are eighth cousins. What? Is that an amazing thing? Yes. He's President Bush's ninth cousin once removed. Cheney's cousin Barack Obama is also Bush's 11th cousin. The year is 1917, and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The Twelve found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States. They help make it. Who are these policymakers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted news corporation. These media heavyweights, and many others like them, are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. 
Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. A special televised meeting of the New York-based Council on Foreign Relations provides a window to the real story. The speaker, Vice President Dick Cheney, takes a question from David Rockefeller. Vice President, uh, I just enjoyed so much your whole speech, but I was particularly pleased that you gave such a strong endorsement for the free trade agreement for all the Americans, a subject that has been of great concern to me for many years, and particularly recently, and I think it's absolutely essential for the strength of our economy. Rockefeller's role in the drive for an FTAA was a lot more central than he portrays. Rockefeller cultivated Latin American leaders who could be counted on to support such a proposal. Both the 1994 Miami summit and the FTAA proposal were conceived and nurtured by a Rockefeller-created network. Prominent among the organizations sponsoring the Miami event were the Council of the Americas, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller, the Americas Society, chairman, David Rockefeller, the Forum of the Americas, founder, David Rockefeller, the Institute for International Economics, financial backer and board member, David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller. Rockefeller's influence also extends to the current administration. He was Chairman Emeritus of the CFR when Vice President Dick Cheney once served as a director, a relationship that Cheney concealed during his congressional career. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. <laughs> They're trying to speed the flow of both cargo and people, they say, across this nation's northern and southern borders. Critics call the plan an outright attack on our sovereignty. Congress has been looking the other way. Christine Romans reports. Plans for an integrated North American community by 2010, moving ahead swiftly and under the radar. Robert Pastor is an author of the Council on Foreign Relations document seen as the project's roadmap. We need to deepen economic integration by moving towards a customs union with a common external tariff. I think we need to enhance our security by beefing up both our borders and beefing up our, a continental uh, boundary. But critics fear an attack on American sovereignty, a super NAFTA with borders erased between three very different countries with no public oversight. Texas Congressman Ron Paul is a rare voice of concern on Capitol Hill. We're not supposed to give this to the executive branch devising uh, quasi-type of treaties that uh, the Congress seems to not have any control of, and then it turns out to be managed trade for big corporations and not to benefit to our workers and to our people. The House International Relations Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee have not held hearings on this. And a high-level conference this month in Banff was closed to the press. 